a little sarcastic almost sounds like, by Solomon. And you know that Solomon is uh, is a man that, uh, it's not the last chapter, it's the chapter before last. Um, But maybe we can read this last chapter, the last two verses too, because it's kind of on the same note. So in uh, in, uh, Solomon we see a person that... uh, God gave uh, tremendous wisdom, and uh, but also tremendous riches and power and everything. And uh, Solomon uh, took that uh, everything that he had, and he decided he's going to explore life. And he, by some measures, we would uh, actually say what he did was actually somewhat wicked. Um, well, definitely. Certain, I mean, the worst thing that I think that he has done was building these different uh, temples for these different goddesses uh, and gods, based on um, because of, because of his wives. But you know, there are other things that really uh, are really creepy and weird. You know, obviously his seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. That is not exactly healthy. Uh, but uh, God let him do that, and um, and it almost. It almost a little bit crushes our idea of God. I mean, wow, <laughs> don't you stop him? Don't you chastise him? There is a chastisement there, but at the same time, it almost sounds like God allowed, okay, let's take a person, a man of God, and he wants to, you want to taste the mud? Okay, then why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and taste the mud, and then tell us all about it so that we don't have to go through it, all right? And so um, he obviously, when you see his record, it's obviously very, it's almost depressive and very pessimistic and, uh, and uh, definitely doesn't look like a happy man, even though this man had everything. <coughs> and so we have a great pool of wisdom from a man that, and this, is ha- this happens even to us. I mean, if you, if you mess around and if you um, mess up your life, then in some ways you'll be able to give some wisdom to people around you because you will tell them, please don't, don't do what I did, you know. And there is a certain wisdom. Essentially that's what he did, right? He went through a certain path and now he's telling us, don't do it. Uh, which, by the way, uh, kind of crushes the idea of a person um, only be saved if they actually stop sinning. <laughs> this, this man is a, is a great sinner. This is like a one sin after another. It's a terrible, 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 terrible sinner. Well, we think terrible sinner, but it's just he did what uh, he took uh, to the end. What we often um, t- are tempted with, also and perhaps sin, he, in, if, even if it's just in mind, right? And so I'll read uh, chapter eleven, verse nine and ten. It says, "Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth." Walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee unto judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. And then in chapter 12, put the last two verses. Um, Let me go back to verse 8. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yeah, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And farther, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ah, it's pretty cool, pretty pretty, uh, unscrupulous ending um, to this whole exercise and his whole life experiment. Um, and he's telling us, you're going to pay for things. There's going to be judgment. Do what you want to do, but keep that in mind. It's coming to an end, and you will be brought to a judgment. You will give an account. So we'll, we'll let me talk about that. Um, let's just sing uh, one more song. 237.
Let me just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for uh, giving us uh, one another and this uh, uh, hour and this time to to be able to be together and uh, and uh, read your word and be edified and be. We see that uh, there's actually many faithful men a meeting all over the, this country and other countries seeking your way. And so uh, we pray that uh, you would uh, bless uh, uh, churches uh, that uh, truly seek you and, um, and follow your word. We also pray for uh, this new Sure Foundation uh, church in Manitoba, that you would uh, bless it and uh, that people would uh, get to find uh, you through that church and that people that are already yours uh, would continue to grow and so we pray for their tremendous blessing and uh, as well as for the parent church in uh, in in the states and lord uh, please bless us as well as you see fit please give us uh, wisdom to follow in your steps and uh, and um, have uh, hope in uh, in what you uh, promised and focus on that and we pray that uh, you would uh, bless also this uh, time of uh, study help us to 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 see and be touched by your word by your spirit in jesus name amen <clears throat> all right so the um, this is a little bit uh, 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 custom not custom uh, this is uh this is uh, a, a topic we're going to discuss. Uh, it was ordered last night. And so <laughs> I, but it actually fits what we were talking about. Remember last uh, week, we were talking about the Vogue uh, generation and uh, the, uh, this, the, the venom of the Vogueness, which is uh, destroying uh, societies. But in some ways, I've talked about it before, sometimes people panic. And they say, oh, it's terrible, everything is being destroyed. Sometimes that which is dead, um, you don't notice. And it, it may be uh, deteriorating for a while. And then it actually dies, but you don't see it. Because on the outside, it looks still standing and looks fine. But it's actually dead. And then people only are horrified when uh, wind comes and topples down the tree or something. It's like, oh, it's terrible, you know. But it was dead the whole little time. You know, so in some ways, actually, the wind does a, a bit of a favor, all right? You know, because now we recognize what is what. You kind of stay away from the, that wood and, uh, and it kind of clears up the place. So in some ways, um, you know, in some ways, it's obviously very sad to see destruction of churches, like COVID, right? COVID was that kind of a wind, right? And uh, people are revived. My goodness, people stop coming to the church. Well, maybe that's a good thing. It, Let's, clear, let's see who is who, you know. And uh, there's probably a lot of people that, um, you know, they, 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 obviously we do feel sorry about this. Uh, there's some people that were weak and, uh, and needed to be a little bit more um, sheltered and uh, nutrition, nutrition uh, and uh, now, you know, this came and kind of destroyed that. But some of that is actually good because it's a cleansing, uh, you know. God does that. God provides some cleansing. I mean, God took uh, people from Israel and brought them to Babylon. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, he said, you can come back. Well, when there was an opportunity to come back, only 50,000 came back or 55. And maybe a few more later. But uh, out of uh, probably over a million, you know, that's a relatively small percentage that actually returned. But, you know, the generation that did return, that was a very different generation. You can actually start doing something with that. So what about uh, when Gideon goes to the battle and, and uh, God uh, tells him, okay, you, there's too many of you. Let's, let's filter out. And uh, from 20,000, it filtered down to only 300. And so this is uh, Jesus. Jesus uh, has a crowd and then he tells them, you know, you know, you have to follow me, and you, 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 if you follow me, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And say, so we're not bond with people, and so. On. So by the time he's done, only twelve disciples uh, stuck with him. So sometimes these uh, winds are not necessarily bad; uh, they are obviously not nice to see, but they can be, uh, in fact, uh, in some ways uh, productive and beneficial. Um, so we were talking about vocalness and vocal culture, and how to treat, how to heal, how to cure uh, the poison, the venom 
uh, of wokeness, and we were talking about thankfulness. That gratefulness uh, is is one thing that's really missing, which is at the heart of just about every so-called woke uh, radical out there. They are very spoiled and bratty people. And so, in fact, uh, today what we're going to talk about is a great continuation, and it just uh, makes sense to talk about this in that context, because we are talking about raising the next generation. And, um, and I would say, you know, it's always like that. They, the world takes that which is good and turn it into evil, and they turn that which is evil and turn it into good. You know, so we were talking about minister. You know, you have ministers, which means servants, uh, and they turn into masters, you know, and nobility, right? So uh, they just turn things upside down. Uh, they, 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 they are killing little babies, but they, they turn it into choice. Uh, we're uh, talking about wokeness, you know, woking. Uh, it's good to be awake, right? It's the idea of being awake. It's good to be enlightened. It's, it's kind of see the light, right? You know, like... Uh, was it Archimedes, right? Archimedes is scratching his head. How can I figure it out if this is gold or something else? And then, boom, light goes on. Okay, I know I'm good at it, right? We need light. We need to, we need to, I get it now, right? And that is the true awokeness. You know, God actually tells us that we don't want to be people of uh, sleeping. You know, they that sleep, sleep in the night, right? But we ought to be watchful. We ought to be awake, right? You know, and... Uh, but these people, they're telling us they're awake, you know, but they're terribly asleep. This is the weirdest thing, right? You know, you guys are drunk. And um, we need to, when we talk about uh, raising the next generation, we want to raise children that are completely awake. Hence, you know, even just from the simple standpoint, you want to stay away even from substances that will make you somehow drunk, all right? You know, I actually don't have a, such a strong uh, position that it's a sin to take a take a beer. And you have to understand, I come from Czech, so if you disagree, that's fine. But uh, uh, this is quite normal that people uh, take a glass of beer after lunch, and it's just uh, just a thing. All right. That that said, we don't practice alcohol, you know, but because I just even if it was okay, I just don't want uh, to have even this idea of. Uh, of uh, somehow potentially play with the idea of not to be completely awake and sober, all right? Because we want to be sober, you know, so there may be a place for alcohol, you know, they say give, uh, give a drink uh, to someone that's dying, you know, so th there may be, uh, you know, if, you ha if it's a merciful thing, if you see on Omaha Beach somebody in tyranny and agony, and you know that the person is not going to make it, you're going to give him morphine, you know, which you make him drunk, you know. And so, so you simplify and, and smooth out the, the, the terrible end. But the, in general, I, I'd say that, that uh, any kind of uh, drunkenness does not belong to um, a person's life. And so uh, we do want to be awake. We want to be bright and smart. And uh, there are certain things that uh, are connected with that that we will talk about today. All right, we want to raise generation that's awake, that's uh, that's bright. So let's uh, let's let's think about this. You know, if you look at the scripture, so we're going to talk about raising children and um, how to how to raise a really good next generation. The thing is, if people do not raise next generation with intent, then automatically things deteriorate. That's just a principle that we see. It's called entropy. Everything, literally everything in this world deteriorates, right? And so it's the same thing is even with the nation. Nation will deteriorate if there is no uh, wisdom, if there is no light. It will deteriorate. You cannot just, even if you try to do your best to replicate what you received, it will still deteriorate. That's the interesting thing, all right? Even our, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know, if you take uh, coffee and you, you put there the, the old-fashioned way, you know, the old-fashioned way you would grind a coffee, put it at the bottom and pour uh, hot water over it, right? If you do a second one, then it will still produce coffee, but it's already diluted greatly, right? Now, if you try to do a third one, you know, it's probably just a dirty water, if at all, right? So it just dilutes. It gets worse and worse. And so there's got to be fresh stuff, something living that must come in for, for, for even just to match the previous thing. 
And unfortunately, we live in a, in a generation, people just believe, because we have an educational system and a few other things, that uh, it will just be replicated. It <coughs> won't be replicated, it will naturally deteriorate, and it will probably deteriorate even faster, because there is obviously poison and evil that actually tries to deteriorate things faster. They probably think that they are trying to help out, they're trying to improve certain things, but that's to wake Awake people, right? So they bring to school uh, and places like that uh, wickedness, and then uh, the children learn it, and that's their new standard. Well, now they are now they're already diluted. Now it's it's quite bad. So um, when we look at the scripture and we look at people, uh, some instances, uh, how do they raise children? Then we have some good examples and some bad examples. We'll start with the with the with the trouble uh, kids, the bad examples. Now, one for example comes to mind is Eli, the priest, uh, in the in the days of uh, the last days of the of the period of judges. Right, Eli was a priest, and he had two sons, and they were wicked. All right, and we'll talk about him a little bit. And then we're talking about Samuel. Samuel was a, obviously a great man of God, but his children. Sounds like no, the no, note sounds like the Bible clearly tells us that Samuel's children were not as Samuel. Uh, there was something, uh, something not quite right. Maybe not as bad as Hophni and Phineas, the sons of Eli, but definitely not the the quality and the, the level that Samuel was. Isaac, Isaac uh, produced uh, Jacob and Esau, and Esau didn't turn out. Maybe he he kind of fixed up his life later on, but it, it was not really that great uh, to start with. And certainly, uh, we're not impressed by man, uh, Esau, because, you know, he would be willing to give up on his uh, heritage, inheritance. Jacob, Jacob uh, produced children, but they are almost killing each other. They are co committed terrible crime. Remember what they did to that nation with the circumcision? Um, Reuben uh, slept with his uh, concubine. <laughs> it's just really quite a mess. Uh, then you have a David. Uh, David raised children, but uh, it's a mess too. You know, one uh, is, is just a, like which which of the sons of David were really impressive. People thought Absalom. Well, Absalom turned out to be one of the worst. Uh, so um, perhaps Solomon. You know, but Solomon is a child of. Uh, of uh, something uh, quite uh, dramatic, of, as, as we know. Uh, then speaking about Solomon, who did he raise? He raised uh, unwise Rehoboam, who lost basically most of his kingdom. Then we have Hezekiah. Hezekiah produced a terrible child uh, at a 12 years of age, and that's a little bit part of the problem. Uh, Manasseh takes hold of her throne, and for 55 years, he, that's, that's like a COVID for 55 years. So this is just a terrible decline uh, of Israel. It's like really went downhill super fast. And he has the, the greatest uh, negative influence on the nation of Israel. We were a little bit looking at the periods of good kings, bad kings, and I think it's like 70% were good kings if you measure by time, or maybe even more, was it even like 80%? It was just really good. Hezekiah, Josiah, Joshua, and so on, Joash, and so on. Isa. A lot, a lot of these kings were very good, <clears throat> and typically the bad guys only ruled for a short time. So big so I think it's like, uh, I forget what the ratio of man, good versus bad is, but if you measure by time, then if it was not for Manasseh, because Manasseh ruled for 55 years, if it was not for, for Manasseh, it would be actually quite a, quite a good place to be, all right? But then during Manasseh, it really went downhill, and only in the end of his life, he kind of woke up, finally, you know, and uh, started to uh, do some reforms, but it was not enough. Now, so we have uh, bad examples. We have some good examples. Uh, for example, Bathsheba, I would say, uh, you know, Solomon, obviously we know that Solomon kind of went off rail, but we see a lot of good things with Solomon, especially at the start. And who were his parents? Well, Bathsheba. And it's interesting uh, that it's Bathsheba, because Bathsheba is not, doesn't have a completely pristine record, as we know, and neither does the father uh, who committed adultery with his mother. So this is really strange that we actually have a quite a noble character, at least at the start, from people like Bathsheba and, uh, and David. Uh, we see the <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 31, where Solomon is quoting uh, this mother speaking of Proverbs to her son, Lemuel. But I suspect it's probably, 
It's probably what he heard throughout his childhood from his mother Bathsheba. So I think uh, this was actually quite a good woman. Uh, and obviously a woman that needed much grace. And so uh, she definitely had some wisdom. That's my speculation. It was her. But, um, how about, <clears throat> but, uh, but we have to assume, by the way, we have to assume, if you see Solomon, if you see of this kind of wisdom and fear of God, then we've got to assume there's something healthy there at home. Yeah? Then, of course, we have Hannah and Eli. Uh, they uh, actually don't uh, end up... The reason I say Eli, obviously, the husband of uh, Hannah was... What's his name? Uh, Elkanah. And uh, so they didn't necessarily raise the child because we know that he grew up actually with Eli. As bad as Eli was with his kids, actually, Eli had some character. Uh Eli is a very good example of something that we need to pay attention to because Eli himself, the, he knew certain standards. He was not happy with his sons. He just really failed in parenting. And he also failed in being uh, faithful to God as far as his service. We know the way it ended was kind of not very nice for, for Eli. But that said, I think Eli actually contributed to something positive in Samuel's life. Samuel grows up uh, basically under his wings, and he is the main force of bringing, uh, you know, raising some uh, values and that sort of thing in Samuel's life. And it almost sounds like uh, maybe he put a lot of new effort and a lot of maybe new energy and hope into this new child, seeing his old children are such a disappointment, yeah? Then, of course, we have uh, Timothy and his mother and grandmother. You know, we see a good man, and Apostle Paul is mentioning, you know, uh, his mother and grandmother, they, they clearly had an influence, Christian influence. We see Mordecai, which is an adopted father, uh, father to, to Esther, really her uncle. We see Elizabeth uh, and um, uh, the priest, um, uh, what was his name? What was the John's Baptist uh, father's name? Uh, Zachariah, yeah. So these, uh, these were good parents, you know, people of faith. Yada, yada, yada. There's so many a good examples. There's, there's so many bad examples. And so we can a little bit, uh, one way to study and see how to raise a good generation and how to avoid pitfalls uh, is to see a little bit from other people. And if I see, I personally, if I see someone that I am just impressed about, even if it's not necessarily a Christian thing, if I see, let's say, a man, uh, I've been uh, watching a little bit uh uh, some uh, series of somebody is rebuilding an old yacht, uh, old wooden yacht. And uh, you can see certain qualities in this young man. And uh, he is, uh, I think he's like 28, 29 years old. But he is very manly and he he has a lot of good attitudes towards just work. He's not a Christian, but it's just, you know, I'd like to see his parents. You know, like, uh, what, what is there? It's very impressive. I have a customer in um, Saskatchewan down in Weyburn area. And I just am impressed how he handles uh, the kids, and uh, how, and so I'm curious, you know, what what who are you, you know, how do you do it, you know, it's uh, it's good to observe, and it's good to observe uh, obviously these examples in the scripture, but examples uh, can be a little bit weak uh, because you have to a little bit speculate what did it. It's important to actually have clear doctrine and clear instruction that actually tell you this is the right thing to do, and this is something you want to avoid, and then with that knowledge. And if that toolkit, you can maybe go back to the story and say, oh, I see what happened here. Oh, I see what happened there. Oh, I see where he failed, you know, and kind of see it in practice, uh, the wisdom and the, you know, the principles uh, that uh, we uh, have from the scriptures. So the question is this. We're going to talk about how to raise the next generation and how to raise it well. The question is, what is the trick? You know, is there a trick? Uh, is there some secret, some kind, is there, is this a luck, pure luck? You know, like, a, like you have a stock of animals and it just happened to be a good bull and that's going to be very productive seed and not productive. Is that what it's all about, really? And, um, or is there more? And I'd say, yes, there is more. So I'll take you to maybe a um, uh, surprising place, but uh, the Bible tells us what is the uh, criteria for an elder, for a bishop, for deacon. And uh, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, we have uh, one of those lists. 
Uh, Timothy obviously is uh, sort of the right hand of Paul. And Apostle Paul is asking Timothy, go around because we have churches without pastor, right? He says, go and appoint pastors and uh, so that uh, there is order in the churches. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible tells us what kind of a person a pastor, a bishop should be. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, hey, sober, right? Awake. He's got to be awake. Good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not a covetous. Right? So those are all very important virtues, great things. But notice, and one that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Okay, so this is something we observe and we want a pastor, an elder, somebody in authority, even in the, in, in this, in the affair of the world, we really want to find people that actually have some quality. So we want to see their life. We want to see how they raise kids, right? Because it's a, it's a great uh, testimony to uh, what is actually inside the heart. Because it's a long-term project, right? Anybody can come in front of a camera and give a smile and put some makeup on and make a big show, give an impression to people that, hey, you're dealing with something uh, great. But it's just a veneer. It can be just a very, very fake it's too late. We already started. You can go home. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, man. Right. Right. So uh, the, the the there is there is uh, uh, some value in her children that actually demonstrate. Or a little bit exposed who that person really is in a long in a, in some kind of long term, and uh, in since this is something we require from a person, and we're talking about all these different values, and then also one that ruled well his own house, and his children are in subjection with all gravity. That means that having children in subjection with all gravity is a result of a character. It's not some accident. You know, children don't grow up to be humble and diligent and, uh, and hardworking and full of grace and, uh, and uh, respectful and not rebellious and all these things just as an accident. It doesn't happen like that. It happens to a man that is blameless, has been one of a wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior. And this is the result of that. So that tells me, and I always, it always bugged me whenever somebody uh, had a problem with a child and they told me, I, I just hate it. Please don't ever accept that. And they always say, we did everything and we just don't know. You know, that is not true. And I realize that there may be some cases where, where a child uh, can go berserk. And, you know, Solomon uh, supposedly was raised well, but then, you know, took a certain path and it was, it was, it was bad. So it's not... That once you are raised as a child to a certain way, then from there is just a just a cruise control, just trajectory that can end up it's a bad, it's a good. No, no, not true. You have to the child has to pick it up and actually continue that fight and that journey. And you know, the parents only kind of help you to get going, but then you have to continue. So it's not completely um, incorrect to, to say that sometimes the parents did everything they could and yet the child in the end turned out bad. But for the most part, I'd say, especially if this uh, is still a young person, I'd say that's a failure of a parenthood, I, I think most of the time. So going back to some of these bad examples that we talked about, Hophni and Phineas, guarantee you, bad parenthood. Solomon's kids, bad parenthood. How about uh, Esau? Sorry, Isaac. I'm sure you're a good man, but bad parenthood. Well, how about Reuben, Levi, Simenon, you know, Jacob, bad parenthood. How about Absalom, David, bad parenthood. How about Rehoboam, bad parenthood on, on the side of Solomon. How about Manasseh? Okay, I mean, he was just 12 years old when he took reign, and that's not a place to be. You are, it's just way too big of a temptation. But still, bad parenthood, I have to say. Because by the time a child is 12 years old, that's pretty already far. They say, we raise, I think I read a book that's called, you raise a child uh, until they're 11 years old. 
and I was it was actually quite hard because for me because I was past that age when I actually got saved and I wanted to kind of kind of raise myself you know kind of like fix things and uh, it's it's in some ways irreparable damage in a person if you miss the first 12 years uh, th those are the most critical and so uh, if it was merely a pure luck you know then why required from an elder yeah you know, it's a great elder, it's a great leader. It just turned out to be a bad kid, but, you know, it's just a poor luck. So it's nonsense. It is uh, strictly, it is clearly uh, to, I would say, 90% uh, degree. It is, it is really uh, up to the parent. And um, not luck. Uh, it's, uh, you know, have you seen a person of character? You can bet that there is someone behind that person somehow that, the, that he loved that person. And he raised it, he disciplined it, and he uh, sacrificed uh, for, for that person. There's somebody behind it, right? And that's why that, that person is great. Now, let me just talk about what makes a well-raised child. What is it actually, what does it mean? You know, say his children is subject to mutual gravity. So there's something in there. It just a little bit tells us that there is, the children are humble and, uh, and uh, submitted to the proper authority. I think that's the meaning of that. Uh, but what else is behind the well-raised child? What does it mean? And uh, well, what does the world say? The world say, well, the world, you know, there's no world that has a mouth. But, you know, the, the impression you get from the world out there, what's the impression you get? The impression I get is that um, well-raised child is a product of good education. Maybe. Or maybe uh, it's something to do with uh, success. You know, if a person ends up to be successful, then uh, we've, we, we've succeeded. We, well, well done. Well raised child. If somebody makes a lot of money and uh, kind of makes, as they say, oh, he made it. You know, he made it. He, made, he makes it. He, she makes it. Uh, career. If, let's say, there is a great popularity, famous, right? So it's amazing. Uh, somebody got famous. What a, what a wonderful thing. Um, that's uh, that's uh, the idea of the world, I think, a well-raised child. And of course, we don't want to be too harsh because I'm pretty sure that there is a lot of people that are not safe. They uh, kind of understand certain uh, principles and uh, they actually try to raise children, good children. You know, so that means well-behaved. There's a lot of unchristian people that actually teach their children to say thank you, to say please, right? Uh, to be uh, to be respectful of authorities, uh, so we have a lot of that. Uh, let's not pretend that this is just a virtue of Christians. In fact, sometimes uh, Christians should be ashamed of themselves because they allow the kids to go, go get away with murder, while actually there is an unbelieving uh, neighbor and he's actually doing a better job. That's pretty sad, all right? Now, but what does the word say? Whatever the word of God says, uh, it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, the famous scripture, this is always quoted whenever somebody is thinking about raising children. Proverbs 22, verse 6. <clears throat> the effort is not necessarily on education, uh, although there is, but maybe a little bit different way. The effort is not to teach the children to make it in this world, to be successful uh, financially in, in, as, as, an, as a thing, number one. There's some other things. But, but the Bible tells us, train up a child in the way he should go. And there's so much packed in the sentence. And then it says, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right? So it's a huge influence that the parent has in the early years of the child's life because how you get going that will determine the path forward of that child all the way to the very end. And so what does it say? It says, train up a child, number one, train up a child. So there is a training involved. And it says, in the way he should go. So there is a certain way, and you've got to know what that way is. Right? And then when you know what that way is, you've got to train the child. And training is... When we think about training, what, what kind of training you're thinking about? Uh, maybe preparing for, I don't know, uh, some uh, sport. You know, there is a training involved, right? You know, people that go and tune on TV, they see an hour of hockey. Well, they don't see the many, 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 many hours, you know, of people just practicing. You know, these guys that play hockey, I guess they, they probably practice every day. 
uh, to some degree and, and maybe some days more intensively than others. If somebody climb Mount Everest, you know, that takes uh, maybe a few weeks uh, to get it done uh, with all the, all the stuff around. But there is probably years of preparation for that uh, climb to the summit. All right. So it's the same thing as with a new child. The child, somebody may see just the result, but there is a lot of work, a lot of hard work to train a child, all right? And uh, so, uh, but then the other thing is, of course, to, uh, to know the way. We'll talk about that as well. So what's the objective? You know, what's the objective? Is it just obedient children? Well, I don't think it's always the best to have just completely obedient children. We even, we've seen Karen's, right? Karen's out there. Karen is a person that just obeys everything that she's told or whatever. For some reason, it's always Karen. Um, but unfortunately, there's a bunch of men that behave like Karen. Ah, kind of, that's kind of sad. Kind of like we have a guy, a feminist. That's really kind of bad. Um, so we don't want just uh, people that are just completely... Uh, just obedient and of course we see you know speaking about education and and uh, for example there is many institution of learning uh, for children that basically teach children just to be compliant and completely missing the point of what, what we are talking about we actually want to create children that may one day be a trouble to the system you know because they don't follow just what they are told they follow higher principle and uh, the Bible, even when it speaks about obeying uh, authorities, even there it says, obey the higher power. And that's the problem that sometimes the world doesn't want to accept, that, you know, if you're told you need to be do, well, no. Sometimes what I'm told by my immediate authority is actually illegal. You know, what, Tr what, what uh, Trudeau did was illegal. You know, you know, and what our government said here in Alberta, they actually did illegal things. So we had to obey uh, higher power. And so we actually supported people that uh, understood that and uh, faced even prison because of that, foolishly, because of uh, people out of mind uh, in the position of authority. But they understood that you have to obey the higher power. That's really what I think we need to. So we need to, uh, not just obedience, but also discernment. How about being smart? You know, you know I want to focus. A lot of people do that, right? They want to create a child. And they really teach the child a lot of knowledge and a lot of engineering or whatever. Teach it, teach it. So what? You're going to end up with being a child that's really, really smart. But he can still turn wicked. And now it's going to be even worse because he is very smart. So he's going to be very effective in his wickedness. Right? So that's really silly. Uh, so not just smart. Not just uh, obedient. How about... Uh, you know, people, well, as long as he, you know, I'm not really sure about what he's doing, but you know what, at least he's not taking drugs, he's not being drunk, he's not, um, you know, something like that. He's, you know, th th to me, that's a very low goal, you know. At least he's not in prison. <laughs> I'm happy with that. That's, that's not enough to me. You know, that's a little bit low, low target. How about accomplished children in, in some other way? You know, some... Sometimes parents have a prodigious child, sometimes great in math or great in music. And so they invest everything. Oh, this is a great potential. We're going to make this child famous. And when the child is finally famous, then they go to parties and say, well, my child is famous. Yeah, but you don't. Yeah, but it may be still wicked. It may still be a bright miserable, actually. I think a lot of very accomplished people. If you look at all these celebrities, if you actually had a chance to sit down at a somewhere fire, a little bit chat when nobody's listening, I think a lot of them would be actually very unhappy people. Right? Not fulfilled. So is that what is my objective? Just make you famous, maybe successful, make you rich. Right? Is that my goal? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, that's not, the, if anything, it's not the number one goal. Um, at all. So the objective must be, so it's important when we talk about raising the children, we need to understand the way, the objective, where we actually, if we are training, we got to know what we are training for. And we can talk about training, but if we don't define <coughs> training for what, uh, then uh, we kind of may miss the ball. So training for what? And this takes us back to that uh, scripture in Ecclesiastes. What did we read there? Rejoice, rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart. This is a little bit sarcastic, you know. Do what you, yeah, do what you want. 
You know, you go ahead and enjoy your life. That's all good. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thy heart, and in the sight of, my, uh, of thine eyes. Okay, you, obviously that's your choice, and that's something you, you go ahead and go for it, right? But, but, but know that thou, but know thou, excuse me, that for all these things God will bring thee unto judgment. God will bring you to judgment. Therefore, therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil uh, from thy flesh uh, for childhood and youth are vanity. And also in chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. These two things are saying one important thing you are going to give an account. I think that what I get from this is primarily and above all things, when you're raising a child, you're preparing the child to face God and uh, preparing for judgment. You, you've, that, that's the underlying thing. Now, I'm not going to uh, suggest that a person that's saved somehow is uh, facing judgment. Because that judgment, when a person is saved, is transferred to Christ. And so we are free. There is a belief out there that even if you are Christian, somehow there will be a reckoning. And you will face God and God will go, I don't know, what the heck is it from? Uh, God will kind of play the movie of your life. And uh, you will kind of, um, you know, give an account for all those things. Um, I'm, okay, I'm not going to go completely into that, but uh, the, 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 the message of the scripture is very, very clear. Either a person is under condemnation or a person is not under condemnation. And if a person is not under condemnation, which is done by uh, the sacrifice of Jesus and taking all your guilt on himself, and you cannot pay for that. There's no paying for that kind of uh, service. That has to be only received as a gift. And, uh, and if somebody tries to pay for it, then he's still under condemnation. Because if you are, if you are trying to please God by your own works, then uh, you misunderstand. And uh, then uh, God will require then everything. Right? If you want to pay for it, then pay for everything. And if you uh, are a person that uh, understands that, okay, I'm a failure and I deserve judgment and because of that come to God, then uh, the Bible says that he will make us free from that condemnation, right? Therefore, you know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, uh, chapter 2, right? It says that we are saved by not what works, but by faith alone, not works, lest a man should boast. There's no boasting at all with God. So that's where the judgment is removed. But uh, it, it's, it's the, that, that's really the outcome which I am heading to. When it comes to children, when it comes to children, you want to bring them to the understanding of judgment and that there is God and you're going to face God. And the right thing, right next thing to that, you want to bring them to Jesus who can take that judgment away. And I would say there is no greater objective in life than that. And that's the true for the church, and it's the true for the children. So we could, all, we could almost like park it right here and say, you know the objective, what do you want to accomplish with your children? When are you thinking about raising your children? Make them fear God and give them the grace that the Bible speaks about. Get them saved. And of course, continue in that journey, right? That's really the objective. Um, now, many parents, uh, this is what we recognize, I've seen it many times, I'm sure you have to. Many parents want their children to have a happy childhood, right? Uh, fun and play. You know, I heard it so many times, you know, I didn't have, uh, you know, we, we had it poor, or we had a this and that, and I was always kind of was a little bit jealous of other kids. You know what? I don't want my kids to go through what I had to go through, right? They say. You know, but often, often this is uh, actually a good generation. Uh, they actually went through some really pain, and it made them certain people. And now they say, I don't want my kids to go through what they had to go through. So they make it very easy. 
they cook for them. They don't have to clean up. They they go and play and they, uh, you want this, sure, I just want to, and, and I guess to some degree it's coming out of a loving heart. They want them to have everything. And that's how it is destroyed the, the children. It's a weird thing, right? What an irony. It's a sad thing. Um, um, but you know what? It's not, it's not supposed to be like that. Here is, you know, I was talking about 12 years. I would say not just 12 years. The children stay at home until they are roughly 20, 21. So if you take uh, either the 12 years or then, uh, let's say, the extended period all the way to teenage years and so on, what is it? Uh, why does God give a man so much time to raise children? Now, if you look at animals, you know, what is it? The dogs are okay in about half a year. They're good to go on their own, right? And why is it that for men it takes so long time and many years? Why did you break it? <sighs> Raising child right in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> My goodness, you trouble. Um, you know, God uh, gave you so long time for a reason. And, and that's because there's just so much to do. Right? There's so much to do. And every time I see someone that uh, doesn't realize that they don't take literally every day to kind of inflict, a, inflict some sort of a, uh, or impart some sort of a wisdom into the child's heart, and then you just wasted an important day. And of course, those 12 years consist of 12 times 365 days. So it means like there is abundance. But it's the same thing with the money. If you treat money as, oh, it's just a dollar, it's just five bucks, right? Then surely enough, you know, soon enough, they will be gone. So big money consists of small money and big days uh, consists of small days and many years consists of many weeks and days and every day counts. Every day counts. And uh, of course, there is a time to maybe have more fun and there's time that is a little bit more for work, but everything counts. So it is, let me tell you this, raising children is a work. It's a project, it's a hard work. And it's, uh, you know, we're talking about obviously having children as a great gift and a privilege and uh, so on. But it is also a humongous task that we, we have, not just with our children, but also obviously with the society, with the church. We produce something for the next world, right? And this is, you know, people complain about all sorts of things come from government and so on, but they often fail to realize what their role is. Because, because you can have completely wicked government and you can still change the world if you raise your children well and have children to start with. You know, you're not going to get really into that, but it's pretty sad. Just about every family has a dog and cat and even mouse, but they don't have children. And they train up the dog, you know, oh, puppy, and they're so excited because he can turn around or something. You know, where is the children? You know, where are the children being trained? So this is uh, where this is our generation. Let's go to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, <clears throat> verse three. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. So that must be clear to every Christian. And I will just say it clearly. To me, parents that reduce their children to one or two are disobedient to God. Period. And they're foolish. It's a foolish thing to do. And uh, this is not supposed to be some sort of offense. We all made so many mistakes. So I don't want to say this as some sort of a, hey, this is something to be guilty for the rest of your life. I've made my own mistakes, many mistakes. I should have more children. We should have started earlier, earlier, earlier. The bottom line is, that is a wrong line of thinking to reduce the children. The line of thinking that we are overpopulated is stupidity. Planned Parenthood, that you need to be wise and first um, go to university and become rich. And then we can finally start considering maybe having some kids. is a stupid line of thinking. It's not true. If God gave you uh, the ability to produce children, then God will provide also uh, for those children and for you to be able to raise them and economically provide for them. So it's a lie from uh, people that really hate children. That's what it is. And so children are to be accepted, received. It's a great thing. These 55 plus uh, adult communities is a stupidity. 
you know, the greatest thing to happen in any neighborhood is kids screaming and breaking windows. Do not break windows. <laughs> you know, but you know, you know, it's so frustrating. You create something and kids break it. Man, you're just like it did now, right? I mean, really frustrating. But that's why the Bible says, suffer the little children. Because it's a suffering. You know, how many things? Daniel took a screwdriver and took a screw and drilled it into a tire of a tractor. I don't know how much it cost me, you know? You know, make these stairs down there. Then he took a drill and he, he made in every stair, he made a little hole there. A nice little circle. It's like, what the heck is that? <laughs> Suffering, you know? <laughs> and it's so many nonsense, you know? But that's, uh, that's, that's, that's actually made, <laughs> in hindsight, everybody's laughing. That makes it a little bit uh, uh, interesting life, right? And, uh, but we would like to have everything pristine, nice and clean. And uh, kids, uh, uh, kids, uh, just, uh, go away, you're noisy. And it's just a wicked, really hard, of selfish, selfish mind. Right? You know, children are in heritage. This is, you know, you people think about heritage. What do people think, number one, heritage? It's a real estate, money, right? That's your heritage. But the heritage are children, actually. And it's a sad thing. People are looking uh, at a potential. You can have so much heritage and they throw it down or they kill it completely. And then I, 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 that's how it ends up. These people end up being really poor in the end. Maybe not financially. Maybe they have things, but they are very sad. So miserable people are living in their fancy place uh, by the golf course or by the, some kind of seaside and completely alone. And they ended up, uh, it's just uh, silly and sad. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy, right? Happy. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That you shall speak with enemies in the gate, the idea here is here that you will be proud of yourself. You will be confident. That will give you a certain uh, strength uh, to, to a point that you can, uh, you can stand up with your, hand, uh, with your head high, uh, not proud, but st strong boldly and have a conversation with somebody. Where I think uh, the opposite is that, you know, being scared and not really have that confidence to stand somebody. What does it give you? It gives you to having a lot of children and raising them. And also, uh, it, it, it is a source of actually happiness. Happy is the man. And I have to, you know, we're not quite done yet, but I can see that I, am, I have this deep satisfaction uh, of having children. And, uh, and it, it gives me deep satisfaction. You know, we have conflicts and disagreements, yada, 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 that's part of life. But uh, it's good to see, um, you know, Rebecca being married to, uh, to a smart guy and pursuing something in their life. You know, and we're going to support them, right? Uh, it's good to see the ambitions I hear from my kids. I mean, it's a good ambition, you know. Uh, you know, it may not exactly happen the way you envision, but I like the way you're thinking. And that makes me happy. Also, verse uh, 22, verse 6. We already read that. Let's read it again. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. So the bottom line is, it's not just enough to have the children. Everybody can produce a child. But also, once you have it, you have to invest into that child. A uh, lot of training, a lot of sweat, a lot of frustration, and a lot of tries out, and a lot of uh, failures. But we're going to do it again and again and again until we get it right. So it's a lot of work. But in the end is a happy life. In the end is that boldness that allows a man to go and stand in the gate. Also for that it's important to pick the right wife. Pick the right wife because you're not going to be able to succeed if you don't have a good uh, partner uh, to do that with you. So it's very, very important to, to do that as well. So there is a limit uh, what you can do though. And I wanted to uh, share with you the, my line of thinking when I was younger, I kind of adopted the idea, well, if I want to accomplish something with someone, let's say if I'm a leader, I was a leader of, of a youth pastor or whatever, if I need, if I am supposed to lead somebody, I have to be ahead, right? You know, you cannot be, um, you cannot be a, a person that uh, leads people, let's say to cross the ocean, in some 30-foot yacht or something. You cannot be doing that. 
I wouldn't follow a person like that if uh, the person just told me, oh, I never sailed or I sailed once in this little lake. You know, I probably would not follow the verse because we'll probably both die. You don't have that experience. And likewise, I cannot expect from me to really bring my children somewhere where I myself am not. Right. Can we agree with that? And uh, so that's uh, that's certainly true. But I actually have to say I have to stand corrected on this. And this is I want you to really understand what I'm going to say now. You don't have to be exact. You, you don't have to be exactly where you want to lead your children. In fact, you, you are not able to. All right. What is more important is to realize. Okay. Okay. Here's here's. Let's say with, with this example of sailing. Okay. Okay. We have to get you over the Atlantic. We have to sail or Pacific. Down, you know, to Asia. We have to get you over the other side. I can do it. But I know that you're gonna have to get there. And I know that you're not able to do it by yourself. Well, then what I can do, I can bring you to someone right? that can teach you and that can maybe help you. And so I actually am quite excited about the fact that you as a parent, you don't have to be necessarily, uh, you know, we're talking about a dilution, right? You can only, if you only replicate what you got, it's going to dilute, right? And the reason why it's going to dilute, because first of all, you're a different person. You know, you may be very talented in some areas, and if you're teaching your child the same thing that you are, then you're maybe teaching the child something that you are very naturally good at, and he is not, or she is not naturally good at. So she's going to be definitely worse than you are, just by the fact of the talent. So it's actually foolish, and sometimes people do that, right? I mean, the dad was always a doctor, so the child has to be a doctor. So now you end up with the child being a doctor, and he hates it. <coughs> You know, it would be a wonderful artist or maybe a teacher or something like that, but he's stuck being a lawyer or a doctor because that's what parents did. So it's a clear dilution. And there's always going to be this handicap through my life. You know, he's going to go around and everybody recognizes his name, but it's only because of his father. And he knows I am not what thy father was. It's this failure for the rest of his life. So the thing is, you can actually bring children farther than you are if you do the right thing. And that is to bring the child to the master of the craft. And this is why the Bible speaks about train up a child in the way he should go. It's not about replicating me. It's about, it's about leading the child. And so the job of the parent is to identify, and that's definitely possible, is identify the child, its strengths and weaknesses, and also identify its, weak, its strength and weaknesses. All right, so that will be identify the talent. Identify a certain strength and let's go and promote it. Maybe this is the path you can pursue and, and go for it. Not everybody is very outgoing, right? So, okay, that's not a problem. We will get, you know, it's terrible when somebody that's very outgoing and is very bold or whatever, that everybody has to be like that person. That's, t that's, that's it, it, to me, and it's cruel. To me, that's what the Bible says that you should not take two. Uh, unequal and yoke them together, right? You know, it's certainly true about unbelievers and believers, but it's also very unfair to literally take two different animals and make them pull together. It's going to be a misery for both of them. And this is what people do when they take a child and expect from the child something that's not natural to the child. It's the same thing with the church. Some people are very outgoing, then let them do something that's outgoing. Some people tend to be quiet and uh, are quite happy to be in the background which is actually a misery for the guys that likes to be outgoing, right? So why don't we just uh, be uh, do what, what God made us and uh, just, just explore what, what you're good at and be, be, be good at it, right? And let's accept that not everybody is like you, right? It's the same thing with the child. Every child is a little bit different. Uh, the same thing with the weaknesses. Some children have a tendency for... One thing, well, other kids have tendency for something else, and it's uh, not a good thing. Some tendency, some kids may have a very easier tendency to be a little bit more lying. Other kids may have a more tendency to be always crushed and always kind of doubting themselves. Other children may be full of themselves and full of uh, a little bit uh, uh, this unhealthy ambition and so on. You know? uh, other kids can be really the brush. Other kids may be very timid and almost afraid. You know, so everybody has a different uh, flaws that we need to learn. You know, some people are so athletic, while another person goes and stumbles over every route. It's like, yeah, every one is different. 
And we uh, think the job of the parent is to identify those things. And if he cannot or she cannot help him themselves to the child, then certainly you can find some other help. Right? Like, uh, think about even, uh, you, you know, our kids play uh, violence. Well, I don't know how to play violin. Uh, I can tell they play wrong, but I don't know how to, how to play. I can probably tune the fiddle, but uh, I don't know how to play. But, so, so we found somebody that know how to play fiddle and, and they teach them violin, right? So it's the same way, really, in life. Now, really where I'm going with this, um, uh, it's certainly true with practical things, such as if you, wanna te- if you, want, if you see that the child is, is, uh, is good at something, then maybe find a master and teach them something, uh, that, that kind of art. What I want to say is that leading, the, uh, when it comes to the ultimate goal, right, what is it? It's to face God and, and uh, deal with the uh, impending judgment. Then the idea is to bring children to a master in that regard. And what is that? Well, that master, of course, is Christ. So I would say that the ultimate thing you can do and method you can do with the children is to bring them to Christ. And this, this is not some kind of cliche. This, I believe this is the number one thing that a parent should invest in. Right? Raising children when it comes to the word. The Bible tells, uh, tells us in Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, they were brought unto him children, little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And disciples rebuked them. But Jesus says, Suffer the little children. So it's not just suffering because they break things, but suffering just them being children. You know, they may cry and they, they have to carry you have to carry them and change diapers. You know, it's a little bit of an inconvenient, isn't it? But Jesus says, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And his hands he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So Jesus actually encourages his peop- the people and actually rebukes those that try to stop it. Um, bring children to me. And so I think the role of anyone, especially parent, is to bring child to Christ. Bring child to the Word. You know, hence, it's just a practical, this is not, I'm not bragging earlier, but just giving a hint. Uh, we are practicing, we do Bible study every day for at least an hour, an hour and a half, even with the little children. You know, and people sometimes, oh, I don't know, you know, they always have to, they, they do all sorts of things, but when it comes to Bible study, always try to make sure so it's not too boring. Um, well, you don't do it in other areas. You know, I mean, let's say math, right? Like the kids are going through math. You insist, you have to learn, you have to learn, you have to go through it. You don't care that it's boring, that they don't like to do it. Why don't you apply the same principle for the Bible study? And then speaking of them, when it comes to Bible study, it doesn't have to be boring anyway. You know, it's quite fun to study a Bible study. If, if you don't make it terrible, then uh, Bible study can be a pie fun. You can be creative. You can obviously tailor it to the age and to the needs of the child. But, you know, go through everything. And I was thinking we were going through some math on this. And we were uh, calculating if we do Bible study. And sometimes, what was the record of Bible study we have done before? Probably three hours, yeah? Uh, like on a Saturday or something. We would uh, sit on it three hours. And um, because there was just so much to talk about, we, it's almost like difficult to leave sometimes. Uh, so, and I'm thinking, you know, if you do Bible study, let's say, an hour and a half a day, and if you count it up together, even just for a period, let's say, 15 years, then uh, that's like a doctorate degree. You know more than a guy that gets a doctorate degree over a period of three years. And when I say it to my children, it's like, wow, really? Yeah, I don't think so. Yes, that, that really is that, uh, that strong. And I'm thinking, and I almost feel like it was not enough, almost, you know? I still feel we should have done more. We should have done more. And, and, and so it's mind-boggling to me, even if it's like Christians, that obviously if they send them to school, they send them to some uh, Christian school, well, who knows what they are learning there. Uh, and the, the parents themselves maybe do... A little bit talk, maybe they do some kind of reading on Saturday morning, you know. On Sunday, hopefully, they go to church. And that's everything they give to their children. And I'm thinking, they are missing so much. How do you do that? And the only thing that parent gives to the child like that is basically role modeling uh, something in their life so the children copy that. But it should go much farther. That's why what I say it's not enough to just children follow the parent. 
Because then, of course, I have to get as far as possible so that my children could copy as more as most as possible. But I'd say we need more, right? I need to I need to, to tell them and follow me along the way to Christ. So that when I am gone, or in areas where I'm not doing enough, they can have more. And actually actually just, just go farther than I am. Or uh, in their specific way to uh, uh, where they are as, as people. Um, here's uh, an example, of course, this is what Hannah has done, right? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27, you know, she says to Eli, For this child I pray, and the Lord has given me my petition which I ask for him. Therefore also I have lent him unto the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. I think it's probably Elkanah. So uh, this is what the, the, child, the, the parents of uh, Samuel have done. They brought him to the church, and that's where he grew up, or to the, to the tabernacle, and that's where he grew up. So my first conclusion here, bring your children. You know, if you want to raise kids well, bring children to the Word. Bring them to Jesus. Bring them to the Heavenly Father. They don't need just you as a father, as speaking about father, but they need also uh, the Father which is in heaven. And I think that's a, that's the greatest uh, thing uh, really a person can do when it comes to children. Now, a few practical things, three really. Um, raising children, um, uh, raising the next generation, three main uh, things we find in Scripture. And they, uh, it, it, we shouldn't really fail to emphasize those three things. So number one will be teaching. Number two will be, or number one will be nutrition. Number two will be teaching. Number three will be discipline. All right. So uh, let's just view a uh, few scripture. Uh, look at a few scripture. First Timothy chapter five. And let me just say right from the get go, and I I don't have more scriptures already, but it wouldn't be difficult to find some. The Bible clearly says that the place for a child to be raised and uh, and prepared for life is in the context of family, which is father and mother. It's too sad that this has to be even said. It should be so clear. Uh, I promise you that the children that grow up with two mothers or two fathers or no mother or no father are in some ways handicapped. And uh, maybe maybe more than we even realize. All right? This is obviously nonsense and a complete uh, wicked idea that uh, we, should, uh, we should have this modern family. So-called modern family is a destruction of family. And proper family should be mother and father and parents that love each other. Must be done in the context of family, hence nutrition. This is the greatest place you can possibly create for children to thrive. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will therefore that the young women marry... Bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Obviously, there is a role of a father and there is a role of a mother. And uh, it is another thing that has to be completely stood against uh, or, or faced uh, as far as uh, this propaganda in the world is that uh, the best you can do for your children is... But the best, best thing you can do is just to get rich or successful and and make money and, and, and that sort of thing. The greatest place for a woman is to be at home. No job, no career at home and raising children. Uh, there is no way to, there's no way to do it any other way. And I know that the people will, some disagree, well, that's how you chose, you know, we chose to do this. Nonsense. You, you, it's not just education. You know, like, I am not really, people say, yeah, I'm, you know what, I'm not really a homes, homeschool teacher or something like that. I, I don't feel comfortable. I, for me, it's actually better that they go to school. Nonsense. Nonsense. The children uh, will greatly benefit just for them to be around you. You know, for, we're talking about nutrition. They don't get that at school. Most of the time, if they are with the teacher, they are supposed to be quiet and listening. Right, and if the if there is a break, the teacher is gone. I don't know how is it in schools here. I think the teacher is gone. They want a break too, right? <laughs> They're suffering. You know, they, they want to take a break, so the kids are left to themselves. And now, basically, you have this jungle because there is no rules. You know, the teacher doesn't leave and say, "Okay, he's gonna be the boss, and you're going to all obey." Right? 
No, it's just gone. So it's a jungle. It's basically who's going to have the power and the charisma to kind of rule the class, you know, while the teachers are gone. So you have uh, kids that, uh, that, uh, that can be abused uh, because, because it's all about power sometimes, right? You know, some kids, uh, uh, it's just, it's, that's not nutrition. That's a very hostile environment. Now, I know that some kids are kind of uh, comfortable and, and they're kind of okay, so they have their peers and fun and all that stuff, fine. But, uh, and people say, well, my kids actually like it. So they say it as a proof that actually Bible is wrong or I am saying uh, something that's not true. No, you don't know how to compare it. If you actually did that and raise a child, mother being home and providing for the children, the nutrition, and of course also teaching and wisdom and learn and teach them to just clean up and be well behaved and deal with other siblings and so many other things, then that is the greatest thing to do. So I'd say out, up, absolutely, we raise our girls that way. We don't raise them for career. And we, we raise them so that they are smart, so they can, so uh, my kids are smarter than I am when it comes to English and so on. Sarah already written her first book, now it's a draft. And I'm reading it, man, I have a hard time understanding it. So she's so good, right? But uh, I'd say that's secondary, you know, uh, this, this knowledge. And if anything, that knowledge would be good for her to pass it to her children so that they are bright. You know, I would say raise girls, raise, think about it this way. Who knows, this boy, maybe I'm raising here, um, you know, the next William Tyndale. Right? I mean, if you don't, Raise William Tyndale, you're not going to get William Tyndale. Yeah? But if you really raise, and of course, you have to uh, put aside your, some sort of specific ambition, right? Like William Tyndale. No, you don't know what you're going to raise, but raise it a machine. Raise it a bullet that will be so dangerous that it will you know, shake everything. And that needs a lot of training. But you know what? It may be just, you just raise just one child and that child may make huge impact, right? So raise that child, invest into it. You know, it's a lot of work. And that's, to me, that's, there's no greater ambition. And if somebody creates a uh, William Tinder that's get uh, killed uh, uh, for what he believed and taught, then that makes me, if I was a father of William Tinder, that would be super proud man. I am the father of William Tinder. Right? That would be great. I am the mother of William Tyndale. I am the mother of the man that has done this. And that's a great thing. That, 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 how could you ever uh, meet that kind of ambition just getting a job in, uh, as, a, as a secretary in some company? You know, that's, that's obviously nonsense. It's such a weak, it's weak for all of us, even for the society. Please send women back home and take care of their children. I think this, if, 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 if let's say there was a dictator and the dictator came up with the idea, from now on, okay, we're going to have a one-year transition, but within a year, I want all women to get out of the work and they're going to be home raising their children. And it's, it's weird, whatever. But it's, so, so just run with me with this exercise, mental exercise. I promise you within 10, 15 years, this country will be completely different. It will be a very different country. <clears throat> Let's talk about the nutrition then. Um, must be done in the context of family. Let's go to First Timothy. Oh, we just read that. We're talking about ladies uh, having the role, raising children, bear them, raise them, guide the house, and uh, uh, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So um, let's go to another scripture in the same, um, let's go back a little bit, still chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than infidel. And this I personally see more of a, of a man thing. Man provides for the family, and a man that does not provide for the family is a wicked man. Is worse, the Bible says, worse than infidel. Infidel is a person that doesn't believe in, uh, in Christ, is not a Christian. And uh, what a shame if there is a man that is giving himself everything for even a church or whatever, for some ministry, and abundance his children. Uh, there's first thing first. And I would say even, even uh, let's, not let's not confuse two things. 
Christ must be first. But it's not always church. All right? You've got to know. I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes, you, sometimes you're, you, you can do, you know. But you've got to handle the kids. That's your responsibility. And uh, what a weird thing to help other people with their kids and abandon your own. And this is exactly what people do, right? People go and they are doing, um, I, I don't know, they're te- you know, women are teaching in school and they are struggling with their kids while their own kids are listening to some other teacher. I mean, why? <laughs> why don't you teach your child, right? So it's the same thing with uh, with a man. A man has to provide, and of course, uh, both parents in some ways provide something. But especially when it comes to resources from outside, it is a job for the man, and it is wicked for not to do to to, to not do that. Now, sometimes um, it's just maybe challenging because costs and and uh, the standard of living yada yada. So sometimes it's just a lot of work and a lot of sweating. Uh, and maybe a little bit of creativity and, uh, and effort, how to make more money. And, and you know what? But also, we're not alone in this. God pro- said He will provide. Uh, so uh, so let's, uh, let's go with that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. <clears throat> so not only we're talking about uh, providing a bacon and uh, income and, and that sort of thing so that we, we can exist, but there is also the need... Uh, for the fathers to create an environment which is actually nutritional in an emotional sense and a psychological sense, right? And a spiritual sense as well. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, provoking not children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So in other words, God wants us parents to raise children so that they are confident and bold. And there are certain things, and especially uh, speaks about men, have, could have a tendency to kind of um, uh, cripple the child by being maybe overly harsh or something like that. And uh, it, it leads children to, um, to a very low uh, esteem and that sort of thing. Now, that's obviously uh, another part of uh, creating a nutritional and safe environment. I remember years ago listening to a sermon by Adrian, the late Adrian Rogers. And he was uh, kind of the standard Southern Baptist, uh, but with King James Bible all the way to the end. And he had this, uh, I remember this uh, sermon, he had three F's, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as an idea for raising children. Firm, fair, and fun. And uh, sometimes the fun part is also important, right? You know, make, uh, make family a place that you, the kids enjoy. Let's have a party. Let's watch a movie. Let's do something fun, right? It's not only just, you know, discipline and do's and don'ts. You know, that, that too, but to create a good environment for the kids to thrive. I would say is this, even with Sunday, you know, with, with Sunday or with church, let's make uh, church fun. Let's uh, sing uh, songs uh, with uh, excitement. Let's uh, go and play ping pong. Let's do fun. Let's just have a good meal. You know, that sort of thing. Let's make it fun uh, so the kids can look forward to it. You know, our kids are begging us. Can we go solving? Our kids are begging us. Can we we go to church? Oh, can we go to, you know, I, I like that. You know, and it's possible. Uh, it's it's great if the kids come home and they want to be home. It's great when kids, uh, uh, you know, are hanging out in the evening because we're still chatting and we have to tell them, guys, it's time to go to bed. And uh, as opposed to them, oh, we have to talk again, you know. Uh, you know, let's create an environment that they can enjoy. Um, let's go to the next point. Uh, so we have three. Number one was nutrition. So creating a nutritional place, place where you can thrive. But you know how it is with trees and with uh, everything else. Nutrition itself is not enough. There is also certain intervention. And, uh, and uh, we will talk about intervention towards the end. We'll talk about discipline. If you look for scriptures that speak about any of these three things, nutrition, teaching, and uh, discipline, then the discipline is by far the most repeated ones. You'll see it all over the place. So we'll leave that for the end. Let's talk about the teaching. Um, Proverbs 22, verse 6, once again. Train up a child in the way he should go, right? So there is some training. There is some um, conscious effort with my child to, to, to get him somewhere. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. We have uh, these uh, 
practical instruction for family, uh, for women, for men, for uh, husband and wife, for children, for parents. And uh, the Bible tells us uh, for the children, children, obey your parents. It's not an accident that the number, what is it, number three or five? I know it's not four because that's what uh, Adventists always say. That's, that's the Sunday, number four. That's, that's the Adventist thing. So I know it's probably number three. <coughs> Is it five? Uh, which is the commandment, honor your father and mother. All right. So the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor thy father and mother. So it's no accident that that particular thing, of all things, is part of the, the Ten Commandments. Honor the parents. The parenthood, the provision for the children and raising them, and children responding to that raising with respect and uh, obedience, is actually part, the, one of Ten Commandments, like literally next to, uh, you shall uh, not have any idols. Well, that seems to be big, right? Well, next to it is honor your father and mother. That's how important it is. And uh, so that is, I would say that's absolutely crucial. Children, hey, listen, children must obey and respect their, their, their parents. And I'd say that uh, sometimes children have an easier time to respect the father and they don't respect the mother and I think it's wicked. You, you catch yourself if that happens to you or if you see your sibling uh, not being respectful to the mother, uh, especially when the father is, is, is gone, then uh, you, you do something about it. And you watch your mouth, how you treat your mom or your dad, of course. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That's what it does. Well-raised kids, in general, live longer, live healthier, live more efficient life, more productive. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, we've, we've saw that before, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here's another thing that we, uh, this is more of a tip, and... Um, what we do with our children, we just when it comes to train up the child, tell the children the truth and be open with them. That's kind of what we practice. Practicing, just we're going to talk about everything. There's really nothing that shouldn't have, for some reason, some people treat certain things that is just not appropriate to the child's age. Everything is appropriate to our age. Okay? So let's talk about just about anything that comes up. And especially when it comes to in a, what, what I call the mundane moments. Mundane moments are the best. If you are walking or somewhere and a topic comes up, and we can chat about it. Typically, that is the most productive uh, way of learning. Right? Because they, are, they naturally are, are interested in the topic. They ask questions. And so you can talk about it. You can prove that you have thought about it before as well. And uh, you can actually repeat their concerns and then they uh, respond to that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And you can really have a good conversation. And you, you, can, uh, you can instill very strong certain values. You know, Bible clearly says from the beginning, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 6. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. We talk about the law. And a few other things. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. It's a commandment for the children to obey the parents, Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, and for the, for the parents to really do this. This is a job of the parent to teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Hence, you know, we have this, and we have over that, in all our ways acknowledge him. We are finding any other way, even we give gifts, often there is some kind of a scripture as part of the greeting, bombard it and any occasion is appropriate for uh, practicing teaching to the children and it may be you know some people say well i'm not much into theory i'm more into practical stuff nonsense you have to get into so called if you want to call it theory you know that's open the bible and read it right so that's not a theory uh, that's very practical and you need to listen to that as well second timothy chapter 2 
verse 3, verse 14. Second Timothy chapter 3, excuse me. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. It says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. From where? From his parents. And from uh, uh, maybe Apostle Paul, you know, Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy. Uh, and we know that he called him son. Right? So he had a very close relationship to Timothy. He was not his physical son. Uh, but he definitely treated him like his child. And he, he is encouraging him here. He says, you know, continue in the things which thou hast learned, has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned him. And that from a child thou hast known thy holy scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so all the, when we take this all together, the time to teach and to talk about things and discuss and uh, diligently go through different scriptures and different stories is essential. And it's a duty of a parent to do that. And then, of course, for the child is to continue in those things. And here we ended up with that my main premise, that number one uh, effort and objective in raising a child is to bring it to the Word of God and to Christ. And then, uh, then just see a miracle happen. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. You'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. Now, of course, we, it's important that we are also reading the Scripture, that we know so that we can have something to talk about. Uh, naturally, some, some parents, they, they, they just don't have much to say. Or it's boring. The kids are running away from a Bible study. I think it's terrible that some people turn Bible study or anything like that into something so boring. You know, and uh, it doesn't have to be. It's a, it's a living word. Okay, for the sake of time, we're going to have to leave the last passage uh, for, uh, for next time. What time is it? Is it 12? Yeah. Um, I will, uh, I think it's a good place to stop and uh, to, uh, to uh, take away, uh, the, the thing to take away from this is prepare your children for judgment. Save them from their judgment. And then raise warriors, raise godly children in the, in the great battlefield that we have to that we have to fight it. And you know, and if uh, part of that uh, battle will be some success and economical uh, that sort of thing, that's a bonus. Uh, that's really not that super important. Remember, we are royal priesthood. We are rich. You know, we don't have to have some riches here. And if you have some, then great. And if you don't, then it's fine. Uh, but let's create children. You know, the Bible says for the children, you know, for everything that you have, you know, sell your gold and silver for everything you have, sell it and buy of me wisdom. Was it uh, Proverbs either seven or something like that? You know, come to me and buy for everything you have, get wisdom. And it's a job of the parent to give them that wisdom every day. Uh, parents provide food and they provide safety and they completely neglect wisdom. And yet, the number one wisdom, the number one thing to, to give the children is wisdom. And they say, you know, sometimes we would have a Bible study and sometimes we would talk about it. And we say, well, we actually don't do school first. We start with the Bible study. I said, no, 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 no. We do school. Right? We do school from the beginning. And part of that school is the Bible study. And I actually feel sorry for the kids in the school that they do all the school. They actually don't do school. You know, what is it? Why, why do people treat the Bible study as not, as kind of like a hobby? It's like something accessory. That's the number one thing to do. And then math. And English, right? So, um, you know, and, and when you bring the children to, to, to Bible, you're bringing them to Jesus. Because Bible is Jesus. You know, the, the Word became flesh. So, so how could you ever... <laughs> Uh, come up with a better thing than to bring the children to the Word of God. Amen? Uh, let's leave it at that. Uh, let's pray, finish with prayer. Our final Father, we thank you for giving us children. I thank you for my children. And I pray that uh, you would uh, bless them and continue to nurture them uh, through our, even through ourselves. And help us to uh, uh, continue to be a blessing to them and lead them in a very powerful way. 
so that they can uh, be uh, just just uh, uh, great people uh, of uh, your heavenly kingdom. And we ask that you would help us, parents and uh, children that are going to become parents one day. Help us to to be diligent in all this, and uh, to be to to see the vision and to be willing to give up on things that the world promises and we feel like we are losing out. And surely there is certainly a different uh, sacrifice, but help us to just uh, patiently take that and uh, be faithful in this very, very important role that you put us in. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.